Uh, Richard Futrell is a PhD student in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. He received his Master's in Linguistics at Stanford and also his undergraduate from Stanford, and he also did an inter-university program for Chinese language study in Beijing a few years back. I think human language is the most interesting thing that we could study in the world. Um, only humans have it. It gives us an unparalleled ability to communicate and coordinate. And we still have relatively little idea of how it works in detail. So it's very exciting. And today I'm going to be looking at the universals of human languages and the variation between human languages from the perspective of sort of idealized efficient communication systems. So I'm interested in this kind of question. Why is English the way it is? Why does it have the sound system it has? Why does, it have the, why does the grammar have the characteristics it has? And whether we can explain that. Now just explaining English would be kind of parochial because parochial there's 7,000 languages currently spoken in the world. When we look at all the languages in the world, we see a huge diversity in how they work, but we also see a lot of recurrent patterns and also properties that all languages exceptionlessly have in common. To be honest, we can't say a lot currently scientifically about why a specific language is the way it is, but we have made some progress in saying why um, languages inhabit the uh, space of possible languages that they do. So we've done some, have some progress in explaining the space of variation in languages. So the real question is why are languages the way they are? Why are there English, we can't say why English is the way it is, but we can say why are there English-like languages? While other kinds of languages which we could imagine, uh, such as English with all the word order reversed, don't exist. As I go through universals, I'm going to be trying to explain them in terms of this idea that we can think of human languages as robust and efficient communication systems for communicating with humans. I'm going to adopt the theory of communication that was articulated by Claude Shannon uh, as the sort of core conceptual foundation of information theory. Information theory being the uh, mathematical theory of communication that's used to design communication codes for electronics and many other applications. The idea is that communication just reduces to the problem of reproducing at one point a message selected at another point. And that's it. So you have this setup. There's an encoder. The encoder has some messages that it's going to want to um, transmit to a decoder. It's going to send, it's going to encode those messages into some signal, send a signal through a channel, and then the message is going to be received by a decoder. So in the case of spoken language, um, the signal is sound waves traveling through the air. That's the channel, and you are the decoder. <clears throat> so for example, if the encoder wants to send the message hello, it's going to encode that message as a stream of bits, ones and zeros or something, send it through the channel to the decoder. The decoder tries to, tries to reconstruct what was the original message that the encoder intended. In this case, it gets it right. It says it was hello. What's important here is that all that matters is that the message reconstructed by the decoder is equal to the message intended by the encoder. And once we have this setup, we can talk about what are the desirable properties of a code that the encoder could use. And the desirable properties are efficiency and robustness where efficiency is that the average length of a signal sent through the channel is short, and robustness is that the probability that the decoder reconstructs the correct message is high. So given this setup, you should be extremely skeptical that natural languages are anything like this, um, that they're efficient or robust. It's a common sentiment that human languages are a mess. They're just this sort of historical accident conventional systems that we're forced to use and that if we tried, we could do a lot better and come up with something more efficient and robust. So for example, you should all check out this New Yorker article from 2012 about called Utopian for Beginners by Josh Ford. It's about this fellow who tried to invent a perfect language that was perfectly efficient and un unambiguous and it was more or less unworkable. But um, the article expresses this common sentiment that languages are a mess and that no one who came set out to invent a form of communication would come up with anything like human language. I'm going to be disputing this idea. And the first universal of human language that I'm going to talk about is ambiguity, which in many ways seems like it's the worst aspect of human language from the perspective of ideal communication. So check out this headline. Boy paralyzed after tumor fights back to gain a black belt. So the first thing I think when I read this is that the tumor is fighting back against the boy maybe and that the tumor is going to get a black belt, which is very strange. 
But this sentence is also consistent with the meaning, which is much more plausible, that there's a boy who was paralyzed after a tumor who is now fighting back to gain a black belt. So he's taking up karate. Um, so ambiguity is a true universal. There is no, no natural language which, in which every sentence is unambiguous. This kind of ambiguity happens in every language. Um, and I'm going to argue that ambiguity actually increases communicative efficiency. And I'm going to do that by so showing that there's actually much more ambiguity here than we ever realized, unless you're a linguist and, or a computational linguist and you've thought about this kind of thing. So we thought, there are these two funny meanings here, that the tumor is fighting back or the boy is fighting back. The sentence is ambiguous about whether the, the subject of the verb fights is the tumor or the boy. But there are some other possible meanings here. Uh, maybe the tumor is fighting against a back, like someone's back. Or maybe the boy is fighting against a back. That's also consistent with this utterance. But it's pretty unlikely. Did anyone think of that interpretation? No. So uh, here's some other one. Maybe, um, maybe tumor fights are a particular kind of a fight. And the boy went to v see this kind of fight and he was paralyzed afterwards. Or maybe the boy and the tumor were both paralyzed. The, boy, the tumor was paralyzed after the boy. If we go through this, I could probably come up with 20 or so interpretations of this sentence. But no one was aware of these things. So there's much more ambiguity in natural language than we think. And the point is that most of the time, we're not aware of it. There's just this black matter of often hundreds of possible interpretations of sentences that are licit interpretations of the sentences, but no one ever thinks of them. So here's a sentence which seems nice and unambiguous. Bob hit a home run, but Joe struck out, so the coach yelled at him. This is actually profoundly ambiguous. So when we say home run, it seems like we're talking about baseball. So when I say Joe struck out, it's obvious that this was the baseball act of striking out. But striking out could also mean like striking out on a journey. So maybe this means that Joe left the stadium or something. So then we also have this word him in the next phrase. So the coach yelled at him. Who is him? Is that Bob or Joe? We know that it's Joe because we ha we're applying um, world knowledge. We know that in baseball, it's bad to strike out. And we know that um, baseball teams often have coaches and that coaches tend to be angry at players who do something bad rather than at players who do something good. So it, the reason we don't notice all these possible spurious interpretations of this thing is that we're constantly applying general world knowledge using our general reasoning ability to understand language from the bottom up, from all the way from sounds all the way up to meaning. And we're very good at it um, in that it's unlikely that uh, any of you thought of the alternate interpretations of this thing. So, when we communicate in natural language, we're swimming in this sea of amb ambiguity and we don't even notice it. And it's not just natural language. All conventional communication systems invented by people until formal logic in the early 20th century are ambiguous. So mathematical notation is ambiguous. I've got some examples here that bother me. Musical notation is also, also contains ambiguities. And these ambiguities have not caused major problems. Ambiguity is also essentially what makes it hard uh, for computers to understand human language. So in 1969, people thought that by 2001, we'd have nice, friendly computers that we could talk to conversationally and they could understand anything we said to them. We're still a long way from that, and it's because no one knows how to design a program which can efficiently integrate the massive world knowledge and general reasoning ability that it takes to resolve ambiguity in natural language. But humans can do it, and it's somewhat of a mystery how. What's interesting also is that in 1969, in the 60s, it wasn't really known that this is a big problem for natural language. People thought that the biggest problem for getting computers to understand natural language was processing speed. So people weren't even aware of this massive ambiguity, which turned out to be the problem. So let's think about ambiguity in terms of the communication set up before before. The goal of communication is just that the encoder's message can be reconstructed by the decoder. If your decoder is a human, which is capable of leveraging all this world knowledge and general intelligence to understand things. If, if the decoder is a human rather than a automaton, then uh, you'd be crazy to come up with an, an unambiguous code because the messages would be really long. So let's see what human language would look like without ambiguity. 
So usually when we're communicating, the decoder, the person we're talking to, is cooperatively trying to figure out what we mean. But there are cases where the decoder, decoder is antagonistically trying to come up with the worst possible interpretation of what we mean. And this is in legal writing. And so in legal writing, you have to write completely unambiguously so that no one can come up with a bad interpretation. And the result is extremely verbose <laughs> to say the simplest things, because you have to cover all the bases. So given that we're language is a code not for mechanistic interpretation, but rather for being interpreted by an intelligent decoder, uh, you'd be crazy to use an unambiguous code. And in fact, in general, um, if you are communicating with any agent which has the ability to use context to disambiguate what you mean, the optimal code that you come up with, in the absence of that context, will look ambiguous. With that context, it won't seem ambiguous. That's a general... Um, that's a general fact about communication systems. So if you think about languages being in me interpreted me mechanistically according to word meanings and so on, then it seems ambiguous. If you think about it as being interpreted by intelligent humans, it's actually quite efficient. I'm done talking about ambiguity. I'm going to go to a second topic now, which is word length. For this part, I'm going to introduce a complication to our communication setup. So suppose the encoder wants to send a message, which I'm going to represent as this picture of a cat. It wants, the encoder wants to send the idea of a cat. So it encodes that thing into the word cat and sends it into the channel. Now things could go wrong at this point. Um, maybe, maybe they're saying this word in a loud room or maybe a car goes by and so the message doesn't quite make it through the channel. So the message is corrupted to k -t with some vowel in the middle and the decoder doesn't know what that vowel is. So the decoder is getting some kind of corrupted thing from the channel, which is now a noisy channel. Now the decoder is going to think, OK, well, what is this? It's an intelligent decoder, so it's going to know that this thing was corrupted, and it's going to try to figure out what was the intended signal. So it could be cat, could be cut, could be caught, and maybe some other things. And it'll, it'll guess. So it might get it right and reconstruct meaning cat, in which case this is a communicative success despite noise. Or maybe it thinks it's cut, and it thinks it's some kind of scissors concept. And that's a communicative failure. But if you imagine the encoder wants to send the same message about a cat and uses a longer word, say feline, puts it through the noisy channel, it, um, because the word is longer, when, it, when, the when the corrected message makes it to the decoder, the decoder has more information with which to con reconstruct the correct message. In particular here, there's really nothing that can go in the question mark except E to make this feline. So the probability that the decoder is going to be able to figure out the intended message here is close to 1. And that's because, um, in this case, the encoder used a longer word. So um, all languages have means of abbreviation. They all have pairs of words that are sort of long and short forms of each other. So uh, in English, we have mathematics, which can be shortened to math. We have refrigerator, which can be shortened to fridge. We have referee, which can be shortened to ref, and so on. So um, the communication theory prediction is that when context is highly informative about what a word is, then you can get away with using a short word. If it's corrupted, then the decoder will be able to use context to reconstruct it. If context is not informative about a word, what a word is, you should lose the longer word, because that's more robust to noise. So we did an experiment. We gave people contexts and then pairs of words, which are just long and short forms of the same word, and asked which, which sounds more natural in this context. So in the supportive context, we say something like, Bob's very bad at algebra, so he hated either math or mathematics. This is a context which, makes it high, which highly predicts math. In the neutral context, we say, Bob introduced himself to me as someone who loved, it could be any noun now, and the choices are math or mathematics. Turns out people usually prefer the short forms in these things, but when you have the supportive context, which makes it obvious what word is coming up, they prefer the short form more. That's contributing to efficiency. Uh, we've only done this experiment in English, but there's a way to test a similar hypothesis without doing human experiments across languages, and that's by quantifying how predictable words are in context in large bodies of text. So we do this by counting how often words appear in different contexts. So in the context to be or not to blank, 
in a typical large body of text, such as COCA, which is the corpus of contemporary American English, you're going to see B 86 out of 87 times and BOP 1 out of 87 times. So this word is highly unpredictable in this context. This word is highly predictable in this context. We go through the corpus and get the average predictability of a word in context. The prediction here is that short words should be highly predictable in their average context, whereas long words should be less predictable for the same reason as the pairs of words earlier. So it turns out that across languages for which we have sufficient data, uh, we do find reliable correlations of word length with average predictability. So the x-axis here is languages like English, and the y-axis is um, the negative correlation between word length and the average predictability of that word in context. And the dashed thing here is the correlation of uh, word length with word frequency, which is um, pointed out in the 40s that such a correlation existed, and the correlation with average predictability is stronger than the correlation with frequency. So this noisy channel idea is a powerful one for explaining linguistic phenomena beyond word length. And it's because the reason is that the noisy channel motivates the idea that languages would include strategic redundancy, such that if noise corrupts part of the signal, people can reconstruct that part. So what could that look like? So for example, a lot of languages have number agreement. So in something like the cat meows, we had this z at the end of the verb in English to indicate the fact that this subject was singular. This is completely redundant, but if you can imagine if part of the subject, the cat, was corrupted, that's giving you a little bit of information with which you can reconstruct it. Uh, similarly, gender marking exists in, many la in about half of all languages. Um, in Spanish, and that gender marking is where nouns are sort of randomly assigned to be male or female, and all the adjectives and articles and stuff modifying those nouns have to reflect that gender. So. When I say I live in a small house in Spanish, this word small, pequeña, um, has to end in a to reflect the fact that house is a feminine noun. If I say I live in a small country, then the adjective small has to end in o to reflect the fact that country is a masculine noun. Um, it's, uh, the upshot is that if the head noun is lost, then the gender is giving you a solid bit of information with which you can reconstruct what that head noun was. So th this is a relatively speculative slide. I don't have detailed studies on these topics yet, but it's in the works. So we've discussed ambiguity in word length, which turned out to be, to, turned out to be relatively universal properties of languages, probably. Um, now I'll discuss word order and some of the ways in which languages differ. And again, this is going to require that we augment our communication model a little bit. So let's think about what message is being conveyed in a sentence like, the boy kicked the red ball. We have words here which are modifying other words. So in particular, we've got this word red, which is modifying the word ball, um, to produce a meaning which combines the meanings of red and ball. And so let's represent that connection this way. We're going to say ball is related to red, and the relation is one of adjectival modification. We have this word the, which is telling us which ball is involved. So we're going to rep represent that link that way. Uh, we also have the word kicked. This is a word, it's a verb representing an event. The event has two participants. It has a subject, an agent, the one who's doing the kicking, and it has an object, the patient, the thing that's being kicked. The, thing, the kicker is the boy, the kicky is the ball. We can represent these relations this way. So the kicking event has a subject and an object. In order to understand this utterance, you have to reconstruct this tree. You have to reconstruct which words are modifying the other words so that you can get to the meaning. And in English, it uh, seems relatively easy because it's the, this structure is encoded mostly by word order. So the fact that red comes right before ball means that it's modifying ball and that it's not modifying boy. It's the ball that's red, not the boy that's red. So this structure here, this graph structure is called a dependency graph because it represents what words depend on other words for their meanings in some sense. And in English, we use word order to convey dependency graphs. Uh, but let's look how it works in another language. Here's some Latin from Ovid. The meaning we're going to see expressed is this. My mind brings me to tell of forms changed into new bodies. Let's see how this works in Latin. So here's the line of the Latin poetry, and I've annotated it with what Latin words correspond to what English words. It's 
Into new brings me my mind changed to tell of forms bodies. So adjacency is not giving us a lot of information about what words are related to other words here. So if we look at the dependencies, um, we're changed into new bodies. The word new is over here. The word bodies is way out here. Similarly, the verb brings has its subject and its object not adjacent to it. So not only is adjacency not a great cue here, but also you can rearrange your word order in Latin pretty much as you please, and you still get something that people would have been able to understand in Rome. So you can rearrange this into the English order. My mind brings me to tell of forms changed into new bodies. This is, would have been acceptable Latin. Um, here we have new bodies. Uh, there's the dependencies. I could move new up here, and it still means the same thing. It's because um, the dependency structure in Latin is conveyed not by word order, but rather by the endings of the words. So nova new ends in a, and that agrees with this ending aura here, and this word bodies. So the dependency relations in Latin are conveyed not by order, but rather by the forms of the words, uh, which we call the morphology. <coughs> so there's two different strategies languages can adopt for expressing dependency structure. Now, when we think about using word order to convey this information, like in English, we realize there's uh, multiple ways to do it. So, for example, in English, we say the boy kicked the red ball. It's subject, verb, object, and the adjective comes before the noun. In Spanish, we say the equivalent of the boy kicked the ball red. The adjective comes after the noun. In Japanese, we say the equivalent of the boy, the red ball kicked, where the verb is always the final thing in the sentence. But when we look at all the languages that exist in the world, we, realize, we discover that not all of the possible orderings for these things are attested as actual existing natural languages. In particular, we say a lot, we say a lot of asymmetries in what order exist, or orders exist, in that word order for some relations implies what the word order for other relations is. So in languages where the object comes before the verb, we find that with overwhelming frequency, the adjective comes before the noun. These, are, these universals are actually just very strong tendencies. They're not exceptionless universals. Um, so it's common to have languages where you say the boy, the red ball kicked. It's very rare to have languages where you say the boy, the ball red kicked. In languages where the verb comes before the object, like in English, prepositions come before the noun. So it's common to have languages where you say the boy kicked the ball on the field. Rare to have languages where you say the boy kicked the ball the field on. It's also true that in languages where the object comes before the verb, like Japanese, the noun usually comes before the preposition, which is now a postposition. So it's common to have languages where you say the boy, the ball, the field on kicked. Rare to have languages where you say the, ball, the boy, the ball on the field kicked. These uh, implicational universals, universals where some aspect of language implies some other aspect of language, these particular ones are called Greenberg's universals because they were introduced, they were first written about by Joseph Greenberg, the linguist in the 50s. And this, these are one of the, these universals are one of the, explaining these things has been a big topic in linguistics. So if we want to explain these patterns in terms of communication, we're going to have to augment our communication model again. Previously, we were talking about an ideal intelligent decoder. But we think now, we currently think that to explain these word order asymmetries, we're going to have to introduce some real human frailty into our model of the decoder. Specifically, we need to think about human online memory limitations. So it's a pretty common assumption in psychology that humans have um, a very limited short-term working memory capacity. We can, if you're performing a task and you need to remember seven numbers at a time to perform that task, it's going to be very hard. We have a, a very limited capacity for our online working memory. Um, interestingly, previously we talked about ambiguity, which is something computers can't do well, but humans can do well. This memory thing is something that computers can do very well and humans apparently can't. So I'm going to show you how these working memory limitations are active during language comprehension and how that relates to word order universals. So I'm going to take you through the steps needed to decode the message, the boy kicked the red ball. Humans understand language incrementally, word by word. Each time we get a word, we immediately try to integrate it with um, our idea of what the speaker is trying to say. We don't wait till the end of the sentence to analyze things. So with each word we hear, we immediately decide what to do with it. 
So say I'm, I'm going to show what happens when we, what we think happens when we listen to things word by word. So you hear the word V. There's nothing to do with that yet. So we'll just keep it in memory because we're going to have to use it later. We get the word boy. We'll keep it in memory for later. And we can also now conclude that V that we saw, the V that we saw earlier was modifying boy. So we can say, aha, there's this dependency relation. And then because of the word order rules of English, we now know that V has no further, will not participate in any further dependencies, so we can drop it from our memory. We get the word kicked. We'll keep it in memory, and we can also say, aha, that, that boy that I saw earlier, that is the subject of kicked. And then we can drop boy from memory because, again, the word order rules of English preclude any further dependencies for boy, basically. Uh, we get the word V, don't know what to do with it, we'll keep it in memory because we don't know what noun it's going to modify yet. We get the word red. Well, we don't know what's red yet, so we'll just have to keep that in memory. We get the word ball. Aha! So that's the red thing. So we can attach that and drop it from memory. Oh, that's what the V was referring to. Okay, we can drop that too. And it's the object of kicked. So the point of this whole exercise is that the amount of time that something has to spend in memory here is uh, lower bounded by the length of the dependencies that it participates in. So um, I had to keep kicked in memory while I was reading V and while I was reading red. I had to keep it in memory for this whole time. And just here, I have this possibility to maybe discharge it from memory. So this leads to the idea that long dependencies, where the distance between two words linked in the dependency is long, are hard to understand because of, they tax our memory resources. And indeed, there's a lot of evidence from eye tracking studies and other sources showing that Sentences containing long dependencies are hard to understand. Long dependencies are one of sort of the two known factors in language comprehension difficulty that we are confident about in psycholinguistics. Uh, so let's look at from some examples. Here's a sentence which I've annotated with dependency lengths. So John threw the old trash sitting, John threw out the old trash sitting in the kitchen. So this has a dependency with length two because it's going one and two. Uh, there's another way we can say the same sentence. This is illicit sentence in English. We can say, John threw the old trash sitting in the kitchen out. And this sounds a little bit awkward compared to this, a little bit hard to understand. And if you take the sentence and increase the length of this intervening material here, it gets even worse. So, John threw the old trash sitting in the kitchen from the party that Mary had come to, which is a great time, out. It's, it's, it's um, very difficult to understand that sentence, and we think it's because by the time you get to out, you've basically forgotten what verb it's supposed to attach to. <coughs> so, and it turns out that in production, people prefer to produce this kind of sentence rather than this one. They prefer to produce this kind of sentence, which is easier for the decoder to, with limited memory to understand, rather than this thing. So let's look at the word order universals I talked about earlier. The dependency length idea suggests that maybe also languages Maybe the word order patterns we see in languages reflect this um, dependency length, this idea that it's good to minimize dependency length. So um, it's common to have languages where you say, the boy the red ball kicked. Rare to have languages where you say, the boy the ball red kicked. And I'll show the dependency structures for the critical part here. The common word order is the one that has short dependencies. The rare order is the one that has long ones. Similarly, this thing about, uh, the object, when la in languages where the verb comes before the object, the preposition comes before the noun. This is the English type. Similarly there, if you were to have this disharmonic order, as it's called, then you would have longer dependencies. So this observation gave rise to this idea in the, originating in the early 90s that these word order implicational universals can almost entirely be explained as dependency length minimization. And that raises the question, is dependency length minimization actually universal? Is it the case that when you look at um, actual utterances that people produce in languages, dependency lengths are relatively short compared to what they could have been? So we had, we had a goal um, to verify this dependency length minimization idea by looking at real examples of language use across many languages. Um, this could tell us if language, if language users universally prefer shorter dependencies, and also if languages uh, do not force people into using orders with long dependencies. Um, we looked at corpora bodies of text in 37 languages, which were annotated for dependency structure by hand, so they were correct. 
And so it was relatively easy to count dependency length in these data sets. And we compared dependency length to random baselines. So we took the sentences and reordered the words in them while maintaining the same dependency structure. We looked at four different random baselines where we had different constraints on the reordering. There were previous studies with the same approach, which had only looked at English, German, and Chinese. They found strong evidence for dependency length minimization in English. The dependency lengths observed in English were much shorter than the random baselines, but they found very weak evidence in German and Chinese, which raised the possibility that maybe dependency lengths in text are just as long as a random baseline, which would mean that the whole idea of using dependency length minimization to explain word order universals is barking up the wrong tree. <clears throat> so we applied our baselines to 37 languages. I'm going to walk you through this figure. So let's look at Spanish. So what we see here is this blue line. This blue line is the growth rate of actual dependency length with sentence length. So this is like sentence length 1, and this is something like sentence length uh, 50. And we look at the sum dependency length of all the dependencies in a sentence and how it grows as a function of the sentence length. Red is the random baseline. Blue is the actual attested word order. And we see that the dependency lengths in the actual attested word orders grows more slowly than the random baseline in all the languages. There's also a green line here, which represents the optimal, the dependency length of the optimal ordering of words, the order of words which completely minimizes dependency length subject to certain constraints. And we see that in some languages, their dependency length is pretty close to the optimal. So for example, Portuguese here is fairly close to the optimal, whereas other languages are really much closer to the random baseline than to the optimal baseline, like Turkish. Um, this variance is was uh, not ex we didn't expect it, and it's very interesting. We want to explain it, but we don't have an explanation yet. Uh, but the point for this paper was just that uh, all in all languages, the real dependency lengths are shorter than the random baseline, significantly so, shorter than all four random baselines. So to summarize, we've explored this idea that language is an efficient, robust code for talking to humans, rather than for talking to some system that mechanistically interprets things according to um, rules and by looking words up in the dictionary and so on. Um, when you consider language as a code for talking to agents with human-like properties, that is having general intelligence and these memory limitations, then language comes out as a fairly efficient and robust code. That's all I got. Okay. <laughs>
it's, it's, I, it, I don't think there's any consistent results that some languages, given the same amount of training data, are easier or harder to understand that I know of. Uh, let's give a hand to Richard for a great presentation. But what is this toy? It's a strange looking toy. That toy is actually a scientific instrument. It's a, a color top which Maxwell used to elucidate the nature of color, or our perception of color, I should say, quantitatively.